Stubblefield. Welcome back, our uh, co-host, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Good morning, Rob. Great to be here. The Badger Delegate, Michael Heights. Good morning. Great to be here. The longest tenured member of our crew, Michael Carl. Good morning. It's always great to be here. He is the only fully bearded member of our team, Larry Schultz. Great to be here today. You sound so enthused, yes. <laughs> hey, just like always. Via telephone, Joseph Joey Tuntz Ferretti. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Joseph. Uh, a couple of announcements to make here. One, Colin tells me the Martinsburg football game will begin at 7 and not 7.30 as previously announced. <laughs> so 7 o'clock is the uh, kickoff for that one there. And also the Veterans Day Parade in Martinsburg tomorrow gathers at 10 and begins uh, at 11 o'clock, and they'll meet at the BFW afterward for a, a gathering, too. So uh, no intros this morning. I didn't finish them, and the last time I tried to uh, do them without having completely finished them, it was a total failure, abject disaster, a, a bomb. <laughs> oh, I must not have been here. <laughs> yeah. total, total bomb. It, it, was, complete, it, was not, it was not total. Complete, it was a complete disaster. <laughs> so... I, after after doing that once, I said, I'm not going to do that a second time. So uh, straight to the business at hand, and that is uh, uh, the uh, Friday Five and Joseph Reddy as the leadoff hitter. Joe, you are on the clock. Gosh, no intros. I can hear the shouts of disappointment uh, across the eastern panhandle. I'm, I'm guaranteeing you, Joe, ones of people have noticed. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, um, it's, it's going to be difficult because you'll have to everybody speak a little louder because of the sound of weeping in the background like, and the grief. Uh, like, like I said, no intro. ones of people have noticed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, well, Rob, I'm going to pick up with uh, my first topic, and, and uh, it, frankly, it's, a, it's an easy one. Uh, I'm interested, of course, in how the panel wants to uh, uh, diagnose and conduct an autopsy of the election that we held on Tuesday. And I, I posed as a question to the panel, uh, I've asked each of us to come up with uh, one thing that the Dems uh, may have done wrong in this campaign or where they failed, and one thing where the Republicans excelled and were able to pull out a victory on Tuesday. I'm going to focus on, uh, frankly, Rob, a, something that I'm sure you and I remember, given our ages, a uh, episode from – all in the family and Archie Bunker in the early 1970s. Great show. And I recall this, I recall this vividly. Uh, it was about the fact that Archie Bunker had to eat meatless spaghetti. <laughs> and he had to because he couldn't afford meat at the store. And I'm, I'm sure people of our age will recall the inflation that racked our economy and our society in the 70s. Uh, and it took Paul Volcker and the Fed raising interest rates to 20 percent to break the back of inflation and get us back on track. Uh, now, that, of course, caused mortgages to be 18 percent if you were going to buy a home. And it caused a lot of disruption uh, and an economic stall that uh, resulted in high unemployment and a, and a real problem for the American economy in the 70s. And it led to the ruination of two presidencies, Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter. So I look at that as a lesson as to what happened to the Democrats in this past election. It was clear when people told pollsters coming out of the voting booth and even before they voted that the economy was the number one issue. It was clear to me that inflation was the number one problem with the economy. And having gone through a period of high inflation, not historically high, as, as uh, one presidential candidate maintained, but high nevertheless. Uh, the psychology of that uh, affected a lot of people. Unemployment oftentimes will affect your neighbor. Inflation affects everybody. And going to the store and paying a grocery bill became a real problem for a lot of Americans in the lived economy. And despite many ep economic metrics being favorable, during this these last four years inflation was really i think the pinpoint of economic woes and is what uh, caused a lot of people to reject the biden harris administration in this past election so i think the democrats had that problem on the republican side i'm just going to give you my experience living in a swing state i think the republicans ran a remarkable campaign 
historically they rehabilitated a man that we're going to be writing about for the next few decades at least uh, to get him tolerable again for a lot of people voting was a remarkable feat in and of itself. And then the effort on the ground, I can tell you living in a swing state, the mailers coming to my home were five to one Trump. The ads on television were even more for Trump. They were reaching people where people live on their cell phones and on their televisions. And though the Harris campaign bragged about their ground game and how extensive it was, and they were laughing at the Trump campaign because they had armies of people knocking on doors, no one knocked on my door. And my vote counts as much as the person who lives in Fulton County outside of Atlanta. But no one came to see me, even though I don't have an extensive voting record in Georgia. I've only lived here four years. Where were those people? And why weren't they getting the vote out? Across every county in Georgia, whether it was in Atlanta or in the way distant suburbs, Trump outperformed, Harris underperformed. So whatever ground game, whatever campaign the Harris uh, folks thought that they had mastered, it failed. They didn't reach people like me. They didn't reach others uh, around my neighborhood who who probably would have voted uh, Democrat if they had an opportunity to learn a little bit more about a candidate who had only been in the race for 107 days. So those are the two reasons, I think, uh, not the only reasons, of course, but two reasons, I think, that we got uh, Donald Trump as our next president. And, of course, I'm interested in what others have to say. All right. Very good. Let's start first with Michael Haidt. Well, I think there's a couple of things when you look at the Democratic side of the equation. One that sticks out is that Vice President Harris had one of the highest disapproval ratings of any vice president um, going into this. She was at 55 percent disapproval. So t to pick her as the replacement for Biden, I think, I think is a huge mistake on the Democrat um, side. They they should have tried to pick somebody that could have gotten away from the Biden-Harris administration altogether, and then they could have ran a campaign um, that, that made sense when you're saying we need to turn the page or we need to make some change um, and, and to get away from the economy. And, and then you could have had somebody that says, yeah, I agree, the economy is not going the right direction. We need to do this, this, and this to, to improve it. Um, but that didn't happen. And then when that didn't happen, and then you, once she became the candidate, she wasn't she wasn't opening herself up to the media. And you even had the the mainstream media, who's who was all in for her, um, started complaining that she wasn't doing interviews and making herself available. So if if you want something that they did wrong, I think those are, are two key factors. If you want something that the Republicans did right, it was just the opposite. Trump made himself available to everybody. Um, he was doing interviews with anybody and everybody that would listen, and not just uh, regular interviews, but people like Joe Rogan, um, which you know you can dispel if you want to, but Joe Rogan. His, his interviews are three hours long, and when he sits down and, and just has those conversations one-on-one, -on -one, it's just a regular conversation. It's not a normal interview that you would expect of a candidate, and I think when he sits down and people look at those, it dispels some of those uh, accusations that the left was making that this guy is a demon and he's a Nazi and and he's the the Antichrist and and all the things that was being said about this guy um, were dispelled by him sitting down and having just these one-on-one -on -one conversations and uh, I, I think for the average normal American citizen some of them were looking at that and saying you know he's not as bad as as he's being portrayed to be. And uh, so I, I think that worked in his favor. Mike Carl. Well, I fully agree on the uh, inflation was, you know, the, the, especially the basic purchase item inflation was a major player in, in the outcome. <clears throat> Living here in Martinsburg, West Virginia, though, I can't, I can't identify with the 
uh, on the field, uh, you know, active campaigning that <laughs> you, you got in Georgia. But, but uh, the, in fact, the only thing I got was a, uh, uh, an illegally placed campaign sign for John Doyle in my front yard that lasted there about five minutes. <laughs> but uh, so, so, uh, but I, I'm impressed that the, you know, your report about the, you know, the on the on the ground act, you know, field work of the campaigning and the difference, and and you know it, because you know. Trump lost Georgia last time, so that was a big deal. Thanks, Joe. Billy? Yeah, looking at the margin of victory, and it was a huge margin of victory, it's hard to say that the Democrats did a lot right and the Democrats uh, uh, or the Republicans did very much wrong. Uh, evidence would show that the Republicans ran a much stronger, more effective campaign than what the Democrats did. We had a conversation uh, uh, several months ago, shortly after Harris got in the race. Uh, Mike Hyde and I were talking about what's going to emerge as a principal issue. Uh, my argument was is going to be vibes, how people feel about it, the message of hope, the message of excitement. And Mike's, Mike's argument was, no, that makes you feel good, but folks are going to vote on issues, understanding the issues. Mike, you were right. You were very much right. It was an issue, primarily the economy, and uh, Harris never separated herself from Biden. She had the opportunity, but she kept coming back to the Biden, uh, Biden economics, and that was not a winner for her. Uh, she, in hindsight, what she should have done is to spend more time getting separation from Biden and making herself more available, which she did not. But again, it comes back to the fact, and you saw this all the way through the campaign, running a feel-good, running a very positive campaign. Trump did just the opposite. Uh, he ran a very negative campaign, a very fearful campaign. One would think that the vibes could have had a burn, but they did not. It was, all, it was I think, issues driven throughout. Larry Schultz. Yes. Uh, first of all, the um, um, whole issue of inflation uh, clearly had an impact uh, on this race. What's interesting is the people who were so worried about inflation voted for a guy who's going to put tariffs on all kinds of, not just, uh, you know, basically place tariffs on some stuff that we're having a disagreement with to make the other person get in line on foreign policy, but all kinds of imported goods. Those tariffs will drive the price of stuff that isn't even imported up. There's no question. And so they voted for a guy because they were angry about inflation. I do agree with that. Um, but what they are going to get is a lot more inflation uh, which will, in retrospect, make Joe Biden look like he did a very good job on that topic. Inflation has come down to the usual place where it generally runs, 2 to 3%. But it's headed back up. And the price of eggs four years from now is going to be more than the price of eggs now. And not just a little, not just 3% more. If this, these tariffs go through that these folks voted for... Um, that's not going to work too good. Another point about uh, what Bill was saying about the massive difference, only about 55 or 60 percent of the California vote has even been counted. California has 22 million registered voters. This uh, difference between the two candidates is going to shrink quite a bit by the time they count all those votes. So it's not a historic blowout uh, in the popular vote. It's the first time in quite a while that the Republicans have even won the popular vote. 2004, I think right, was the last 20 one. years. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think by the time we balance it out, the numbers will be somewhat closer to what the numbers look like four years ago in total vote. On election night, the difference between the total vote and the 2020 vote was 20 million votes, 158 to 138. Now, of course, there's millions of votes still out there, not just in California, but in states that are still processing stuff. I think I saw that 
<clears throat> I can't recall a southern state. It strikes me, Alabama perhaps was only about seventy percent in. And I may be wrong, it may be a different state than Alabama. Um, so w there are some problems, especially with mail-in ballots, okay? Having said all that... Um, well, you're you focusing know, they, on the number count as opposed to Joe's question, which was the right, thing that the uh, Democrats uh, could do different. Right, which this is a transition I was just about to make. Sorry. Um, you know, the things that Democrats could have done differently is to, to be somewhat more aggressive in showing how the tariffs that they now are going to have the power to impose upon us uh, are going to drive up uh, inflation even more. So if your issue is inflation, this ain't the guy because he's going to raise your prices uh, unbelievably. Um, they should have done a better job on that. And obviously, even with what I was saying about the numbers, turnout is off. Uh, 81 million people voted for Joe Biden. That was the largest number of votes any person ever got for president in the United States, ever. And we haven't yet come close to matching it. I'm guessing turnout will be down something on the order of 8, 9 million votes. But why, Larry? Why? I think because uh, for some folks who are Democrats, I know folks, who said, oh, well, uh, you know, this trouble between Israel and Palestine, I can't vote for either one of them. And to me, if you really like Palestine, uh, you made a mistake there. But that was uh, one state. That was uh, perhaps two. Michigan, a little bit of Wisconsin. It was, But we had low turnout throughout oh, the country. Th even, in, even in Berkeley County, it was yeah. only 42% yeah. as, uh, as stated by Tony Petrucci. And I think in 2020, it was like 60%. I don't know if that I, number is completely yeah, accurate, yeah. but I yeah. it was very low this time at 42%. Well, I think maybe there's some West Virginia problems that will play into that. In other words, we, we have a pretty unbalanced ticket statewide and a lot of democrats just say well, what am i going in there to vote for i mean uh, are you, you saying know, total point. total turnout is down or are you saying democratic turnout is down? total turnout is because down. I, last i looked yesterday trump had uh, about one million votes less than he did four years ago and with california not all i'm not granted california is not his state but i would think that that would make once they're all the counting's done he would be very close to what he he got in 2020 right it's, but, but in it's, 2020 but it's that harris was, that has lost all the democrat vote in 2020 that was 47 percent of the vote and he lost <laughs> This time he won. It's fifty one per fifty point one percent. But that's my point. He's gotten the same amount of vote. He got the same amount of votes right. that he did four years ago. But he won this time. So it's not the Republican well um, or voters I, that are I, down. It's it's the Democrats well, that didn't come out and vote for their candidate. Well, right. It, it, but well, understand, twenty twenty was a record election, and you may not have the goal of being able to match that every time. Um, I, I mean, after all. People had recent evidence of the way Donald Trump was back in 2020. Maybe some of them have forgotten a little bit. They're going to get reminded now. Uh, I think we will see uh, a very high turnout again on the Democratic side in four years. Because, uh, like I say, the other guy got a massive number of votes last time. Uh, Joe Biden got a massive number, the all-time record number. So... Uh, we shall see uh, what happens with this and what the final I'm interested in the final turnout because uh, obviously the Democrats didn't do a good enough job turning out their vote because I, I think they, they turned voters off more than turn them not didn't turn them out Larry the Hispanic vote went 52 48 for the Democrats that's a four from what I understand the last report I heard that's a tremendous loss of support in the sure. Hispanic vote for Democrats and I think every moment spent counting how many votes was 2020 versus 2024 is, is wasting the time. If the Democratic Party doesn't get some cold water on their face and understand why they are losing middle class and working class people's votes, they're doomed to continue to repeat but, this process. But did you say the same thing in 2020 when they got pretty well smoked by Joe Biden? I didn't have to. I'm, I'm t this, this is four years. There's been a dramatic right. sea change in how minorities support the Democratic Party in those four years, Larry. That's okay. the reality. I mean, we certainly know some things about that. 
let's see when Trump carries out the promises those folks voted for. But that's, 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 that's four years from now. we got to look yeah. backwards. I'm talking look, yeah. about yeah. what happened to the and Democratic Party's support and, base and, in the last four years. Joe Ferretti, get on the, you're on the phone, so you're getting excluded from all this. Go, go ahead, please. <laughs> Did you mute yourself, Joe? Joe? Hello? But the I'm, I'm the, sorry, yeah. Right, yeah <laughs> Joe muted himself. <laughs> okay. I mute people, Joe, not yourselves. Yeah, yeah but yeah, very yeah. quickly. We're all capable, Rob. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, I, I, look, Macomb County, Michigan, was a case study uh, with a problem that the Democrats have uh, with uh, the UAW uh, in particular, but in and people who work with their hands in general. Uh, Macomb County was traditionally, uh, it's outside of Detroit, and it is where uh, a majority of UAW members reside who work uh, for the big three up there. And uh, that turned Republican. And that's a that's a real red flag for Democrats. Now, tariffs, interestingly, had played a big part in that county because it's clear and the automotive industry is talking about this every day. The Chinese are coming with their cheap cars uh, funded by the government and their quality cars. My brother has taken them apart as, a, as an engineer with Ford, and he tells me these cars coming over here are going to cost twenty-five dollars to $30,000, and the quality is remarkably good. And that's both EVs and gas cars. And they, everybody knows it's coming, and they're especially sensitive to that in Michigan. And the tariffs play well with the UAW because they see that as protectionism. The government's going to protect those jobs by putting a tariff on those Chinese cars. And Macomb County goes Trump. So, uh, you know, some of these, it's granular, albeit it, it is granular to go to that extent. But look at it. But I think nationwide, I think it's correct that the Democrats have to be able to speak to these people who work with their hands and say, look, you know, we have policies, too. And I think that that message has been lost. Uh, they're, they're not. I don't know if they know how to speak to them. And I think this has been a, a problem that's been developing for, for decades, not just the I last agree. four years. I agree. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's another major problem that the Democrats have uh, is messaging. So uh, and, and to Mike Height's point about uh, the Biden-Harris administration and, and uh, uh, the, the desire to get away from it, I think the die, if you look back at and this is with hindsight, but if you look back at this, I think the die was cast a long time ago. The sitting president has a 38 to 40 percent approval rating. Anybody associated with him is not going to do well with the electorate. And that was Harris's mountain to climb. And as good a campaign as she ran, again, in 107 days, I stress that, uh, that was a real tall climb to make. And it, it proved to be insurmountable for her to have that kind of yoke uh, you know, that she has to carry with her as she campaigns throughout the country. So bottom line is, uh, I, I think inflation was one of the main drivers of this. Uh, and one thing I've learned, and, and this is to my pal Larry on this, if you're, and it's clear to me, if you're explaining these days, you're losing. Joe, okay? I, uh, and, and that's that's why I, well, I think it, the Democrats were in a tough spot. They're, is, they're always is, is that because nobody wants to hear the explanations? Or just because yeah. we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, thanks for leading us off the, with, a, with a good topic there. It's on this beautiful Friday, the Badger Mike Height, who's going at, we were going at it during the break. <laughs> the Badger good morning. returned to full form. He was badgering it up there during the break. Yeah. Also, Michael Carl, senior member of our crew. Good morning. Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Great to be here. You heard from Mr. Ferretti, and now with issue number two, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Thank you, Rob. Uh, in response to Joe's question, Larry wanted to look forward. Well, I'm going to give him an opportunity with my question, uh, my issue, rather. Uh, the Democrats are very pessimistic right now. They, uh, uh, they did not, the election did not go as they wanted to do. Uh, the question is, do they have any reason for optimism 
for the next cycle. Uh, and I would like to uh, pose a couple of reasons they may be optimistic. Uh, one would be the candidates which are sitting on the wing. Normally when, a, uh, when there's an incumbent president, there are no candidates running against him. We rarely see someone running against, uh, from the same party running against the incumbent president. Uh, if Harris had won elected, this, ca uh, this stable of very talented people would remain on the sidelines for another probably four eight years. Uh, I think now you're going to see several governors who have done, have carved out a national reputation, and I think in the next three or four years they'll do it even more so. Governor of Kentucky, Governor of Pennsylvania, Governor of North Carolina, Colorado, Maryland, also the leader of the Democratic Caucus, all very talented people, and they're going to have a chance to, one, develop their issues, which Harris did not have, their position on very stands their, their positions which Harris was not given the opportunity to do so so I think you're going to see the next cycle uh, some well thought out positions that will have had a chance to uh, to vet them and by some very very capable individuals uh, the second thing would be some of the issues themselves and this is something Larry was uh, kind of hinting at uh, Soon to be President Trump, uh, as two of his major platforms are the deportation of migrants and tariffs, both of which most economists say will be quite inflationary. Some economists say will be very inflationary, uh, not only tariffs, as Larry has mentioned, but also the deportation of migrants, which are the underpinning of a lot of our cheap labor in this country. If they've gone, prices are going to go up. The third thing is uh, cutting, uh, uh, eliminating the taxes for Social Security. This has to be paid somehow, somewhere, and it's going to uh, accelerate the, uh, uh, the problems we have with the Social Security. So I think uh, three or four years from now, uh, President Trump is going to have a very difficult time balancing his platform with keeping inflation under control. He may very well do it. He may have all, pull all the cards, but it's going to be a very difficult task because his platforms would argue against an increase, increase in inflation. Can he do both? We'll have to see. So your question is, what are the reasons for optimism exactly. for Democrats? Exactly right. Yes. I'm going to go to the king for Democratic optimism of our group, I think undisputed king of it, and that would be Michael Carl, a well-known <laughs> optimist of the Democratic Party. <laughs> yeah, I'm optimistic about... Uh, <laughs> politics, but not the, the Democratic Party. Uh, basic, Bill basically uh, took took my uh, issue away. Oh, <laughs> but, man. You know, but it, it, a little different angle, yeah, as, sure. as, 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 as you can expect, because I believe that the, uh, th this is, you know, Tuesday's election was just a manifestation of a fairly extended period of decline of the Democratic Party as a broad-based leader of, of public opinion in, in the United States. And, and all these allegations about the tariffs, once again, the, uh, you know, we, we just heard that uh, some, of, some of Trump's votes in some of these states came because of, of the, using the word tariffs, but they're selective. And 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 they are they are not blanket tariffs. Nobody talking about that. And it and it, and it, it's to undermine the unfairness of 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 communist Chinese competition with 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 American uh, auto industry among among you know foremost and among others. Uh, so so uh, don't 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 be uh, you know uh, assuming that. Uh, uh, you're, you're the, 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 we're going to have inflation because because of of Trump's tariff reference. It's going to be we're, we're actually going to have a better, stronger economy, and 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 the uh, deportation of deportation of illegal immigrants, and that's that's going to improve the working opportunities for you know, real Americans. Uh, so, uh, and, but my question, you know, I will stop with a question. 
who and, and Bill started with it. You know, he got got a little specific, but I can't imagine who the Democrats have who can who can step up and and win election in twenty eight. Larry Schultz. Um, first of all, to answer Mike's question, one guy that comes immediately to mind is Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania, He's an immensely popular governor who um, uh, has the right ideas and is a tremendous uh, public speaker. But uh, setting that aside, I did hear Donald Trump say he was going to put tariffs on all imported goods. I heard him say it. You, you heard that through some liberal media no, report. I heard Donald Trump <laughs> flapping those big orange well, thumbs that, telling me about say, say, Saying things and doing are two different things. Well, and, no kidding. That, with Donald Trump, that, that's absolutely he true. He's just sending a message <laughs> about tariffs, and, and it's not right. blanket. And believe me, we have not... We've gained because of Trump's use of tariffs in his first term. Look, what, no, what about the farmers? What about the farmers of soybeans? They, we had to impose several hundreds of millions of dollars to supplement the farmers because they were going broke because of tariffs. Did they go broke after we did that? Not because we, we okay. bailed them no, out. No, we, we, we bailed them out. Them out. It's a balancing act, you know. Uh, well, don't, don't, okay, so we're going to bail out giant corporations and big farmers um, and there's going to be a lot of people out there who are saying, wait a minute, the money you're spending the bailout, I'm paying in as taxes, and the value, the cost of the goods also went up, so I'm now worse off than I was on the day I voted for Trump. The, the difficulty, it seems to me, is that, and, and the deportation of illegals, I got some news for you, Mike. A lot of the people who dress the chicken that we eat every day are not American citizens. In fact, chicken poultry processing plants are full of illegal a aliens they're, they're, who are not paid. Those are two different words. An alien, you can have a legal immigrant who is not a U.S. citizen, but... Illegal aliens. Illegal immigrants okay. who are not here but, like... But, but they that, are those, working in thousands and thousands of jobs. Because you're an alien doesn't mean it's illegal. Right. It, it depends on how you came here. I get that. Okay, thank All you. All right, but the problem is when they deport the illegals, those chicken factories are not going to have processing employees, and they are going to have to pay real money to get legal Americans to take those jobs. And the, and the, and the wages of real Americans will go up. Except that of, nobody that. wants to do that work, and that's thing. why illegals are doing it now. It's the same thing. Cal, you know, any place, Texas... Uh, California, any place that grows a lot of food that ends up in your grocery store is using illegal labor to do it right now. Maybe not every single company, but the vast majority are. And when those people leave, those prices are going to shoot up because there's going to be shortages. There's going to be problems of all kinds. So, okay, you want to make sure that we whip on all these people who came in here illegally, but they are contributing to our economy in a way that once they're gone, we'll understand through higher prices. Mike Heights. So to get back to the original question. Um, <laughs> thank you, Michael. <laughs> uh, I, I, think the, uh, I think the Dems have to do a deep dive into why they lost and, and, and take a hard look at their, their platform um, and determine should they they move farther closer to the center than they have in in recent years. Um, I I think Larry's right. I think there are Democrat candidates out there that could rise up and be stars on that side of the aisle in four years. Um, and Shapiro could be one of them. Uh, you and know, Bar Bashir. Barack Obama, Obama came out of nowhere, in my opinion, uh, to become the star over there. Bill Clinton uh, came out of Bill nowhere. Bill Clinton came out of nowhere. So, you know, don't don't count your chickens too quick or dress your chickens, whatever you want to do, um, <laughs> because it could happen very easily. I think what determines what happens in four years, um, to your question, is is 
what happens with the Trump presidency. And what happens with this? Ad- right. right. What what this administration does, um, whether they do the tariffs or not, you know, I don't know. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't. I, I don't know. I think some of it's bluffing. I, I'll agree with with Mike Carl. I think some of it's just a bluff. Uh, but if even if he does, I think it depends on how the economy reacts. And I think the economy played a large factor in this election. I think the the economy will play a large factor in in next election as well. And that's um, my very point in asking the question. Yeah. Right. I, and so I think we sort of have to wait and see how this plays out. But I think there could be star performers on both sides of the aisle. You, Trump is going to go away. The Biden era, Harris era is going to go away. She won't reemerge as a candidate. Um, but there are players on that side. And I think there are players on, on the right side that could emerge and, and take this country in a new direction. And I think in four years, that's what everybody's looking for is is to get away from from where we are right now. Joe Ferretti. Yeah, I agree with that, Mike. Uh, uh, I, I think there's some talented uh, governors in, in Pennsylvania and in Michigan, uh, two swing states, who, uh, uh, who whose name will be prominent in four years. And I, from what I've seen, um, they have a, a lot of gravitas and, and the ability to communicate and, and are smart people. So I, I think the Dems can be uh, buoyed by the fact that they have folks like that waiting in the wing. Uh, but I think there's other reasons to be optimistic if you're a Democrat. Uh, and if past is prologue, look, <laughs> there's a reason Donald Trump got voted out four years ago. He didn't do well during his uh, presidency. And I think that was clear. That's why he voted, we voted him out. We rejected him. And uh, if he falls prey to uh, bringing on his cabinet this rogues gallery of people that seem to follow around with him, uh, the Laura Loomers of the world, the, the, the nutcases who convince him that people are eating dogs in Ohio. Uh, if he brings them aboard, uh, we're in for a, a rollicking good time in terms of how the administration is going to work. And, and, and look, he, he is himself has admitted that he's not good at picking people to work in his administration. All you have to do is look at his comments about the people who worked in his last administration. They're stupid. They're lightweight. They're idiots. Um, it, you know, they're incompetent. These are these are comments he's made about people he chose to work in his past administration. So if he falls prey to that again, and he brings in people who aren't up to the job, at least in his mind, then uh, what's to say that we're not going to be wanting to reject him again in another four years. So I, I, I think there's there's reason for the Democrats to be optimistic, and one of them is Donald J. Trump. I think uh, the mass deportation on day one of illegals is a lot like we're going to build a wall and Mexico is going to pay for it. It's a uh, show. Uh, he knows it's logistically impossible to deport that many people on his first day, and it's also incredibly expensive. So I think that's one of those deals where it's a signal to those who are looking to cross to just stop and those who are here illegally who have some fear to get going back across the border. I think that's really the purpose of that statement. Uh, as we all know, Trump is a showman. This is what he this is what he does. And when he makes statements like that, they're for effect. I don't think they're necessarily for substance. I think there'll be a photo op of some people being dis- uh, d- deported. But if you're thinking that there's going to be 30 million people rounded up and put on jets and flown back across the border or on buses, that's not going to happen. It's just logistically impossible. Mr. Height, you are now with issue number three. Issue number three. So I'm going to go stay with the national uh, theme here and uh, I want to know which is more significant about the election we just had was it the trifecta of winning the Senate the House and the presidency or is it winning the presidency and the popular vote which has more significance Larry Schultz Um, well I think if I'm not mistaken they've won the Senate the House and the presidency before First in the last term. seven years, <laughs> um, and they haven't won the popular vote in 20 years. So just from that standpoint, winning the popular vote was more um, is more significant simply because it's defeating a, a trend uh, that has held on for an awful long time. Um, 
having said that, uh, neither one is very important simply since they are just a mechanism to get us to what whoever is going to be in the government. And then the question is going to be, what does the government do? Does Donald Trump keep his promises? Do the Project 2025 things uh, uh, get treated like some alien thing that Donald Trump had nothing to do with? Or do they start day one trying to uh, enact them with all their um, constitutional and other problems uh, and hoping for a, a United States Supreme Court that will continue to ignore the Constitution isn't that, as going isn't forward? is that the significance of the trifecta? The fact that now you, you have two years, at least two years, where you can get a whole lot accomplished um, – you're, you're yeah. answering my answer oh, for I'm, you, I'm Mike. sorry, Bill. <laughs> and, and you have the Supreme Court. <laughs> well, and, and uh, just to say one final thing, Mitch McConnell, that pillar of uh, decency and truth, has already said that they will not be <laughs> – sorry, Joe. Uh, they, will, they will not be collapsing uh, the filibuster. And so the filibuster will still be in place, and hopefully it can stop Donald Trump's worst uh, instincts – from becoming law um, so that you know as long as the filibuster is still there they got to have 60 votes for certain things and one would hope that the very worst things uh, that Trump has in mind uh, will be stopped aren't by you the glad filibuster. now that the Dems didn't get rid of the filibuster well um, <laughs> yeah. yeah but I mean if you have enough power you can always put it back in only six minutes left in this segment okay. Mike Carl you get a minute of it well I, 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 I certainly uh, uh, agree that that's what's more meaningful is the is the trifecta of the three branches control, and 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 not the unusual you know popular vote win, uh, the, in terms of the future and good good policy, uh, but but uh, uh, the, the whole the, the whole whole idea of of. Uh, you know, we keep talking about the, the uh, you know, the putting the, the tariffs on and all that. I mean, that that's 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 a judgment call. It's it, it, and I totally agree, Rob, with your description of of you know how that's you know how he's using that. Mm -hmm. It's just it, it's going to be selective, and it's it's it. And I I have strong feeling that. West, the U.S. economy will be a lot stronger. Inflation will be lower uh, at the end of Trump's four next coming four years. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, Mike, your question was significance, and I don't know what you mean by more significant. Uh, if you're talking about bragging rights, uh, winning the popular vote, definitely for, it's more significant. If you're talking about impact for the government, impact of getting things done, then obviously the trifecta is more significant. So it can be how you want to define significant. Uh, the other thing is, and filibuster uh, uh, came up, uh, I'm going to be very surprised, and I hope I'm wrong, but I'm going to be very surprised if the filibuster is not eliminated or, uh, during the uh, early years of the right. – don't get upright, Mike, because I don't know. You <laughs> don't know. Put some money on it. We don't, neither one of us knows. But I would not be surprised if it's not eliminated. Mr. Ferretti. Uh, well, I, I think the trifecta is much more um, important – for the Trump administration going forward. I mean, the agenda that they want to push is going to be much easier to deal with when you have everybody singing kumbaya in all three branches of government. Uh, I just think that's undeniable. And uh, so I'm sure that they see that as most important for what they want to accomplish. Uh, and and from, a, from a, another perspective, uh, it's cause for people to worry because I have... I've often maintained I've been accused of having uh, Trump derangement syndrome, and I've often said I'm not worried about Trump at all. I'm worried about the people who won't hold him in check, the kind of people who will go to the well of the Senate like McConnell did and state that Trump was morally and legally responsible for January 6th. And then we'll turn around and, and amass the votes to not impeach him. Uh, I, I would look to those people to try to serve as a check, a check and balances is what this government has been formed from from the very beginning. Uh, and I, I don't think we're going to have that in the next two years. So from the Trump perspective, it's great. From the other side, not so great. 
Mike, you were about to chime in, Mr. Carl, before Mr. Ferretti went. Do you remember what you were going to say? <laughs> uh, no, I was thinking about my next topic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right, Mike, hey, comes back to you. Well, I, I think I think Bill was right. The significance, I think, is if the, the general population is going to look at the popular vote and say that now he has a mandate. It's not just the electoral vote that, that overall the country is going to say he won the popular vote, and that's significant to the general public. To the government itself that is elected, it's obviously the yeah. trifecta. It allows them to get things done um, that that m would have been much harder had they not gotten the trifecta. So I think in this, this next two years, and I, I will say also, I think the Republicans are very bad at doing that. Um, they have trouble coalescing and getting together and getting those things done so the democrats do a much better job of saying yes let's ram this stuff through while we have the the trifecta and and the republicans seem to sit and squabble amongst themselves all the time what what do you think will happen to the filibuster mike i think the filibuster stays i okay. think the most most conservatives uh see the significance of the filibuster um, and I, I think it's only the, the, the left that wants to get rid of it. I, I don't, you know, let me very quickly, I think you're right in part, but I think Trump would want to get rid of it to get his issues through just for the points that you made. I think the significant point of what you were looking for, Mike, was not mentioned by anybody here, so I'm going to mention it. <laughs> That's what I wanted to hear. And that is the popular vote is the most significant of the three. And the reason why is how he got to the number he got to in the popular vote. He was up in every significant category, in every demographic, with the exception of people who lived at Kamala Harris's house. That's the only place he didn't go up in the, he got more in the suburbs, he got more with Hispanics, he got more with uh, uh, black males, uh, he, got, he got more with uh, white women than he had in the past. He got, he got uh, uh, more of the blue collar vote with white people than he did four years ago. Anywhere you can measure where Democrats had a stronghold, he eroded it. And that's why the popular vote is more important of the three you mentioned. And that's the problem for Democrats going forward, is where they lost ground, where they traditionally had strongholds, this is where they lost the election. And if, and if, if they don't recognize that, then they've got big problems two years from now and four years from now if they don't recognize that and analyze it and figure out that their party can't be New York and California. That can't be the party, the Democratic Party. That party's got to be what it was when unions were strong. It's got to be the party that's recognized by working people. It can't be the party that it's identified as now, which is the party that Republicans have stated is the party that wants to put boys in girls sports. That can't be what they're fighting for if they plan on winning any broad-based elections. Hey, we are back uh, with, uh, actually, Larry Schultz on the clock when we return. And on to issue number four with uh, Mr. Ferretti by phone, Mr. Stubblefield, Mr. Carl, Mr. Height in studio, along with issue number four's author, Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Yes. Um, what is Trump's plan to reduce the deficit rather than add another $8.2 to it in the next four years? For perspective's sake, our total... Um, deficits now are just around 33 or 34 trillion dollars therefore in the last uh, in the four years from 16 to 20 Trump ran deficits equal to 25 percent of the total national debt rung up in the history of the country so what is his plan not to do that again um, you could say that COVID uh, drove those deficits, but it didn't start until nine months before the end of his presidency. So <laughs> he was running some pretty big deficits before that, too. Um, and by the way, the guy who came in and dealt with the fallout from COVID, Joe Biden, has about four trillion in deficits or five. So that's not the answer. I want to hear what his pl specific plan is, because he never spoke about it, to get away from record breaking deficits. All right. Mike Carl is the tax man in this room. Mr. Carl? Uh, the plan will be to stimulate the economy through, you know, uh, extending 
his tax cuts, which raised revenues, and to curtail uh, wasteful government spending as much as he can. That will be the answer. Bill? Yeah, everybody says wasteful government spending. Uh, the bulk of our spending is with committed endowments, such as Social Security, Medicare, uh, retirements, and the like, and our federal deficit. There is a very small amount, I think used to be 16 to 17% of discretionary spending, uh, to make meaningful cuts uh, in our this 17 percent to reduce our deficit is going to be draconian uh, i don't know how they're going to do it mike it's going to be more than more of a challenge just arm waving said we're going to bring elon musk in uh to cut to cut our wasteful spending uh the, we don't have a lot of flexibility so where are you going to find cuts within that small amount of discretionary spending Unless you take on Medicare, unless you want to take on Social Security, uh, the third rail of politics. If you want to take those on, fine, but that may be a kiss of death in the next election. The inflation reduction, the, the, the you know, total lie, naming it, the Inflation Reduction Act had nothing to do with those things, and it created inflation. That was not your question, Mike. <laughs> Mr. Ferretti. I'm sorry. Mr. Mr. Joseph Ferretti, unmute yourself. You're still muted, Joe. All right, they'll go. Mike, to, I, there you I, go. Mike, I don't know about that. I think inflation has been dropping uh, since the Inflation Reduction Act was passed. Now, whether there's cause and effect there, I don't know. But uh, good, good question. Cor- <laughs> there's at least a correlation there. Um, but uh, Larry, I, I don't know that anybody's interested in discussing that issue um, <laughs> uh, on a policy basis. I, I was struck, Rob, by your interview of Riley Moore. Uh, you know, our newly minted congressman, and you uh, you posed the question, or somebody on the panel did. It might have been John Gilstrap. You know, what are you going to do now when you go to D.C.? And he talked about immigration and, and you know all the hot button issues that were just from this past election. Not one word about the deficit, the debt, entitlement reform. Rob, you definitely had to remind him that that's an important issue. And, of course, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to deal with that, too. I don't think it's on their mind. Uh, and, and it's amazing to me that we got this train coming down the track pretty fast uh, about uh, entitlement reform, Social Security and Medicare. And, boy, that, that seemed to have taken a back seat, albeit with both parties, in this past election. So I don't know if the stomach is there to, uh, to take the pain. And it's a shame because that's maybe a statement as to where we are in our politics today, that no one wants to make the hard decisions. Rounding up illegals and sending them out of the country, yeah, you know, everybody can, can jump on board with that. But the hard decisions that have to be made by our, our policymakers in D.C., uh, no one wants to seem to do the hard work. Mr. Height. Well, when I looked at page 42 of the project 2025 playbook it said (laughs) tariffs baby tariffs Um, and that's how we're going to fix the economy actually i have no idea my guess is he's going to do what he did pretty much the first time he's going to try to reduce regulations he's going to try to stimulate the economy um, through uh, more drilling fossil fuels um, different things like that he's going to try to bring back businesses to the the uh, the US um, through de- deregulation and and tax breaks everything that, that Mike was just talking about that's my guess you know but you know I, I don't know I, I really don't know Larry back to you I just uh, raised this question because when a Democrat's in office, it seems like all we hear about is the deficit. And what are we going to do? This is terrible. We're bankrupting our country, blah, blah, blah. Now we've reelected the guy who is the all-time record holder. Maybe Hoover had <laughs> had greater deficits than him. But we reelected the guy who is the all-time record holder. And if we then double the price of chicken by uh, deporting all the employees of the chicken factories, um, we're going to be kind of upside down in a way that America hasn't been 
for almost 100 years since the late 20s. According to a search, 61% of the federal budget is mandatory spending, 26% is discretionary spending, and the remaining 13% is interest payments on the debt, which is an extraordinarily high percentage. So 26%. Of the debt. That's that's higher than what it was a few years ago. Higher than what it used to be, yes. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Interesting. And uh, another search says 28% of the federal budget in 23 was uh, discretionary. For the longest time, you heard 17% yes, was exactly. roughly, yeah. roughly it. So and it might also depend on how much of the Defense Department's budget is lumped into the that 61% as well and how much that fluctuates as well. Uh, Mike Carl, issue number five is yours. My question is, how would the stock market have reacted if Harris had won? We know how it reacted with Trump's win, which was a – you know, a nice bump. It's up and down some, but but it's a you know headed up. How do you think it would have reacted if Harris had won? Well, none of us here are uh, money managers or uh, economists. We'll have to give this one a shot based on your own emotions, I guess. Joe, let's begin with you. Well, I, th I think it's hard to say. Uh, I mean, it shot up tremendously on, on the day after the election, and then it uh, kind of went back to its normal pace of things the next day. Uh, so I, it's hard to say what would have happened in the day after the election that had Harris won. Uh, but, you know, it's up 20% for the year. So uh, as I look at my 401k, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy about how things have been going. So I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think implicit in your question, Mike, is that it probably would have cratered uh, had Harris won. And I don't agree with that, given the long-term view of the stock market which all money managers you know they, they teach that we have uh, regarding investments and I, I just look at the long-term view and i think by and large a lot of folks in this country have done very well with the stock market uh frankly uh, up to the beginning point of the biden administration so i don't think it would have cratered i think it would have probably uh, uh stayed flat or, or maybe shown some improvement but uh, a one-day perspective i don't know is, is all that important Bill? Yeah, I think uh, the trend is the more important thing. Uh, there was a big bump in the stock market when Biden stepped out and stepped down and, uh, and Harris was nominated. So there was a bump there. Uh, financial Field the other day said that the market is looking mostly for stability, more so than who the individual is. Uh, so I think the trend has been very positive over the last year and uh, and I suspect the trend is going to continue and I think it would have continued if Harris had been elected as opposed to Trump. Mike Heights. Yeah, I'm going to uh, I'm going to agree with Bill. I think he's been pretty astute today. Um the breakfast the, he had with Mike Carl. I yesterday. think that's what it was. It gets me the today thing. I, <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on, Mike. Give me more credit. Hey, <laughs> at least he didn't say lucid. <laughs> <laughs> that's not fair, Rob. <laughs> I think the market. I think the market looks for stability, and uh, I don't think it cares one iota whether it's Trump or whether it's Harris. I think it's going to try to. The businesses are going to try to make money, no matter who's in charge. And I think you can look at the, the past four years where I think the economy's been been pretty bad, but yet the, the market has seemed to, to weather that storm and, and keep chugging along. So um, had Harris been elected, I think you may have seen a bump one way or the other. It could have been down instead of up. Um, but I think it would have corrected within a day, just like it did when when Trump was elected. And I think the the market sort of sort of chugs along. The businesses invariably find a way to make money, no matter what the rules are. I mean that you can make it more difficult for them, but they will find a way to try to make money. And I think as long as as long as we have a free market, um, I think uh, businesses will continue to do that. Stock market on a daily basis makes no sense at all, but over the long term does. Sure. Because it really performs based on the success of the American economy, but day to day emotions can rule and you get spikes in one direction or the other. But we can look back on history and see that the last time Trump was elected in 2016, overnight the markets sold off and then quickly reversed themselves overnight. And then by the time they opened the next morning, had a huge gain, much 
like they did this time. And the reason for that is Trump is regarded as a pro-business candidate, and he'll be a pro-business president. And as a result of that, that means it's good for business. If it's good for business, that means profits are up, and if profits are up, stock prices are up, and on so so it goes, right? So that's that's good for Wall Street, which is why I think you get a bigger bump with Trump's win than you get if Harris would have won. Uh, on the flip side, as Financialville will tell you, stock markets just want to know what the rules are. So once they know who's in charge, they can understand what the rules will be based on that person and their political party and persuasion. And then businesses at that point can figure out, how. okay, how do we make money under these rules? Because that's why businesses are in business. So it's the first question that they ask you in business class. Why are businesses in business? The answer, to make money. That's the reason why they're there. If they can't make a profit, then they go out of business. So the market reacts positively. We have a president who you think will be friendly toward profits. So I think your answer is what you were looking for, Mike, that I think they reacted better with a Trump win than they would have with a Harris win. Okay, well, as long, well, as, it, long as it's that edge and not yeah. <laughs> ball in the air. But, no, of course, my view was that it would have plummeted at least because of the uncertainty of of what what would you know be in be in, down the road for the economy. But Mike, you've been I don't consistent. know that they would have plummeted because it, under well, under you. the current rules with which they're functioning, which is the Biden Harris rules, the S and P is up I think twenty one percent for the year. So I don't know why that would have changed if the rules would have just continued under the same people. The 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 uncertainty of what her administration would yield would have plummeted the stock market. Now I agree that you know once once a you know things became a little clearer about what was going to happen, uh, it it would you know it it would level out. But but it would have been a, a, a crash, I think. All right, so now we have extra time, and we have extra time. I get to go through everybody's threes and pick the one that I want to pick, which is what I'm going to do on this one right here. And it was impossible to read this one without hearing Larry Schultz's voice in my head. <laughs> when That's I got the way we like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's one voice that I don't want in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. That's why I shoot it out. Do we all agree that the next Democratic POTUS will be free to, A, to commit crimes in their official capacity with immunity, and B, to fire any independent or special prosecutor appointed to investigate them for misconduct? Now, Larry, in context, what was the uh, reasoning for you posing that as a, as a theoretical issue for the next Democratic president? Well, um... <laughs> Simply because that's where we are now with a new Republican president. And I, I want to know if, if you're willing to see that go both ways or if this is going to be the Donald Trump uh, doctrine that only applies to him. All right. I want to start with to make sure Joe gets heard on the phone. We have about six minutes here. Joe, your thoughts on Larry's number three. Well, yeah, and I, I know it's clear why Larry posed the question. It's the old what's good for the goose is good for the gander uh, analysis or analogy. But, you know, I, I, I hope that a reasoned and rational Supreme Court someday revisits that opinion from four months ago about presidential immunity. I think that as, a, as an attorney and somebody who has studied a little bit of constitutional law, I just think that's an abomination. Uh, and that is something we cannot live with. I mean, this, forever in this country, no man, no man is above the law. And and to have this Supreme Court come forward and say, yeah, but except for these circumstances, it just is an anathema. It, it is contrary to everything that we have held dear in this country, uh, that the rule of law is paramount. And I, 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 you know, just to have somebody elected into a position and, and say, well, but you have certain immunities as long as you can dress them up in official acts, I think is ridiculous. And I, I just hope someday that we don't have to have uh, Larry's question become relevant uh, because it, it is uh, something we just cannot tolerate. Michael Height. Well, I, I don't know if we have to wait for the Trump presidency to find out that the the Biden administration is already talking about dropping the 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 uh, Department of uh, um, uh, 
excuse me jack smith investigation. jack smith yeah they're already talking about doing away with this and 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 canceling the the whole uh case already um uh, so it it may be gone before he, trump even becomes president and i i think a lot of that is because the, these these have gone nowhere um they're they're still being litigated or or they're being appealed um and even though that that there's supposed to be a decision made here in the next couple of weeks on Trump. You know, I think most people in America look at these as just a way to have prevented him from running to begin with, that there's not a whole lot of substance to these these accusations and these court cases uh, to begin with. And yeah, I, I think in in 2016, I think the left is what elected Donald Trump. Their, their constant move farther and farther to the left is what made him arise and, and become the popular person that he was. I think the left has elected him again by this constant litigation, and they've made him a martyr in some people's eyes. And Lord knows I don't see him as a martyr, but I, I think that's what you've done if you're on the left and you keep going at him over and over and over again, some people feel like it's it's not warranted and that you're just doing it to get rid of him. And and they don't want to see the judicial system used that way. Mike Carl. Well, uh, I've studied the Constitution and Supreme Court a little bit myself. And all they did in that ruling on immunity was resolve a potential conflict between the the constitutional structure that elects the president and, and identifies the, their role and responsibilities and duties versus some other laws, all of which can be abused by the litigation that we've seen. So that's there, there, there will be no change in that whatsoever, and there shouldn't be. Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah, while Mike Carl was studying the Constitution, I was studying rocks. So I'm not sure I, I can really qualify. Ocean, ocean rocks. Ocean rocks, to yeah. be sure. That's right, yeah. Uh, I think that the uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, interpreted, I'm not sure they resolved. But Larry's question was twofold. One, commit crimes with immunity. That is going to take another Supreme Court to resolve that. The second part is fire any independent special prosecutor that has always been under the purview of the president. So that is not going to change. Say, uh, if a Democrat wants to uh, fire a special prosecutor, a uh, Democratic president, they have the capability to do that. They have the right to do that. Same thing with Republican. But the first part is, uh, is immunity. That is going to require a Supreme Court. What that will mean, what Bill's saying is, is that the unless the president decides that the president wants the independent prosecutor to be an independent prosecutor, then they're not an independent prosecutor because they could fire him at any time. Now, notably, if I'm not mistaken, was it Ken Starr who prosecuted Bill Clinton? It was. Did he get fired by Bill Clinton while Bill Clinton was in office? He did not. And, you know, the problem is now, um, Don, you know Donald Trump's going to fire Jack Smith. <laughs> There's not a question about that. That's on the application form to be the head of the department, to be the attorney general. Question one, when will you fire Jack Smith? Um, and so do we or do we not have a system, as, as uh, Joe talked about, where no man is above the law? And as long as the president has the ability to fire his prosecutor, we don't have a system where no man is above the law. We have a system where one man, at least, is above the law. Um, you know, there are still, uh, without any consideration of the court's decision on the immunity stuff, there are still things that Trump did um, when he was president that were not official acts. They were all about his campaign. Uh, as the data Wrap it comes, up. music's playing. As the data comes out, we're going to see that that's going to be a pretty tough call. Final thoughts, eight seconds apiece. Next, when we come back. Final thoughts, eight seconds apiece. Joe Ferretti, go. Something we can all agree on: Democrats have shown how to lose. Larry Schultz. 
Um, enjoy the weekend. Going to be beautiful weather. Mr. Stubblefield. Our audience has spoken. We need the introductions next week, Rob. I don't think they actually mentioned it. Mike Carl. <laughs> Go Commanders. They're playing the Steelers. I have to disagree with you. Mike Heights. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Congratulations to all the local candidates who won their races and statewide races. Uh, there was one complaint in the section about us not discussing West Virginia state politics. Here's the discussion. If you were a Republican, you got about 70% of the vote. End of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Ramsey's show is next. This is Talk Radio, WNR Martinsburg and TV 10. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you again in 70 short hours. It's fine.